we are live welcome to around the halo episode number six this is really clipping along you guys uh it is exciting to have everyone here chat thank you for uh all the love and support as a reminder we do have notifications off just for these uh broadcasts because we're recording the show we have a star-studded cast with us this evening on around the halo as always i am matt mcclure magic pants matt uh here with little flower media and going around the halo we have bearded marco or matthew marcolini and we are very excited to also have his lovely bride elizabeth santorum marcolini thank you for joining us and then ceo of little flower media john the beard bearded blevins and bridget richardson from max studios as per usual um so this is pretty exciting we got a lot of things going on uh not only because i'm going to turn the camera off on john bridget and myself and just let matt and liz go at it uh yes! you know, for a variety of topics <laughs> which i think is absolutely the viral video we've been looking for fight um, <laughs> no, no, our biggest fight for the first couple years of our relationship was her calling me a monarchist because i believe the constitutional monarchy was a more effective form of government than republic that's honestly but, that's, that's oh, the she truth. was mad at me that's for truth. weeks oh that is incredible i love it well as per usual we're gonna go around the halo here and give everybody a quick uh 10 second introduction to do yourselves everyone else has been on the show so we're mostly dedicating this time to liz uh, because she's new and we love her and want her to stay so uh but let's start with marco on the upper left there go ahead marco uh, mazatov i'm marco the cfo of little flower media um I get us meetings with people. You do, and, I, and you're I, doing I, great, by the way. Funny. <laughs> you're doing great, by the way. Since the entire <laughs> next six weeks, you are busy doing that, which is. I want to cry. We will miss you on stream, <laughs> but I mean, it's awesome that you have so many things going on. Go ahead, Liz. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I am the CEO of R Rose Roofing, and I work for the Labore Society. So we help men and women that have educational loan debt but want to join religious life to resolve it, so they can enter formation. So a uh, bit of my business and nonprofit uh, heart in the world. That is incredible. And you just became my wife's favorite person. John, go for <laughs> I'm it. Also, most importantly, Zelly's mom. That's I, I like mean, a new yeah, tagline. That's, that's a big one. That's, but a, that's big one. a big one. That's You're new, right. but it's it's big. So yeah. you ex for what it's worth, you explain. <laughs> <That's so true. laughs> You explain what you do better in 30 seconds than Marco has in the eight months I've known him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess it's been a year, Marco. Rude. Sorry. Sorry, that was rude. Oh, yeah, I'm just standing right here. <laughs> now that uh, was petty. That was me being petty. <laughs> Jonathan Blovins, CEO of Little Farm Media, Beard Blovins. Uh, I'm really excited for tonight's show. Also, I'm wearing a White Sox hat, even though I'm a Tigers fan, because the last time I did this, someone clipped it and tagged the Tigers, and they were upset, quote tweeted, and roasted me, but didn't send me a free hat. So <laughs> this is an attempt to get a Detroit Tigers hat before the season starts. Okay, good, 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 good pull. Go ahead, Thank Bridget. You. Bridget Richardson, producer of Act Studios. That's all I got. <laughs> that's, and well, that's you have a brand new stream got. room. Look at you. Bridget, you set up a new a new studio. I mean, you have things happening in your, and you, you just really moved. You nestled yourself in the corner there, Bridget. <laughs> yes, I'm very it's nestled in the corner. Vibe. I don't yes. know about you, Bridget, but the last time I moved, it took me 18 months to clear the boxes away from my computer <laughs> area. I set up the computer and then, you know, just never looked at it again. So Which you are doing is great that over there. Yeah, you, you oh, are doing great. Oh, this is St. John the Baptist. Isn't this the most really? amazing icon you've ever seen? He follows oh, you with piercing. his eyes. Yes. Super intense. Yeah, he is following me. <laughs> I mean, he's been in the desert. He's seen things. John, he I follows mean, you on so Twitter. Looks like a man that just chosen. got out of the desert. I feel like, like I just ate some locusts and some honey, and I'm hot. <laughs> chosen. So I, I love it. Okay, well, as per usual on Around the Halo, uh, we do give out points to a game show style format that doesn't really matter. It is entirely based on a whim, and it gives me an incredible sense of power and control in my life that is lacking in every other moment except for this uh, 45 <laughs> minutes that exists every other week. So um, I will absolutely abuse my power to the extreme, um, you know, as often as possible. Um, and again, you know, just, just for the icon, uh, Bridget's getting points already. See, and Elizabeth for being married to Marco, you know what, bonus for you She already well. has two points. I know she's way ahead and it shouldn't be a surprise as to where we're at right now. How about um, a point for me for having to deal with Marco and being sassy to me for the last four days? Negative points for John. Got negative it. points. Oh <laughs> my gosh. 
<laughs> we need a negative point function. I was about, is it added? Is we it do. Added? Yeah, it only adds at this point. I was trying to keep it positive, although the more episodes we do, the more I realize I really need I to be able to take away points. Negative points. Yeah. We need negative and a point for Marco sure. for his incredible stream room, yeah. his, his studio. <laughs> Gives John zero. <laughs> I'll take my zero and still win. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and fire it up. We are on to topic number one. No one is going to be able to guess what this is. Uh, Rock versus Smith, a slap too far. So uh, no one actually watched this award ceremony, but everyone is aware that uh, Will Smith uh, slapped Chris Rock uh, due to him uh, making a joke apparently about Jada Pinkett uh, during the ceremony, and he walked on stage and he smacked him. Uh, I have a deep uh, sense of dislike for us even discussing this topic because i feel like giving it weight somehow is you know defeating ourselves but we're gonna go around the halo anyway and talk about uh why they, they either should have just gotten in a full fist fight and charged you know ufc prices for it or they should have just dealt with it in a twitter fight uh as marco and i will do after this go ahead marco um there's only two options this thing was the the best guerrilla marketing campaign ever conceived by <laughs> mankind in the 50,000 years of existence. Yes, I think young earth creationism is dumb. And secondly, it or it is a really, I love Will Smith. And Bridget obviously loves Will Smith too. We had a bonding moment over it. Um, and I loved it. I loved his music growing up. Um, and he's uh, if this was a real slap, it was not a slap because of a mean joke about his wife's hair. Chris Rock got the brunt of a lot of things going on in Will Smith's life that ended up with that slap. It's never the first thing. And secondly, if it was really about the insult, the first joke people made about him, about Jada and Will and their, and their uh, marriage situation, their differently associated marriage was way more in poor taste, uh, poor taste um, and would absolutely have mer merited a smack from somebody who thinks it probably was a grave sin to do that, and you can't just smack somebody in the face or physically assault somebody because they chose bad words. Um, despite it was taped. The, despite my not wanting to talk about this, I feel like Marco essentially fully encapsulated everything that I would have said, so good luck to the rest of you. Liz, take it away. Um, so this resulted in kind of a hot take amongst, we were talking about this last night, the idea that manly men defend the women they love right like that's kind of a i think a, something that's a little bit lost to our culture is the idea of protecting your wife or your girlfriend your children all of this but i think matt's right in the sense that yes <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna record that and play it over again i just want everyone to know <laughs> that like i he's gonna be going to bed and being like you're right <laughs> um uh, but I, I think that I think that when when I heard about this at first, I was like, okay, is he protecting his wife? Is he trying to, you know, make a point? But then upon like reflecting on it, I'm like, no, there's a lot of people that do horrible things, say horrible things. It doesn't justify our action against them in that way. And it's still, I mean, if we're thinking about it from an ethics perspective, it would still be wrong. Um, even though the intention maybe was, if, if it truly wasn't staged, if it was to defend his wife in some way, um, the action I think would still be wrong. Um, but in terms of publicity stunts, I was reading a couple articles about it today and a some body language professionals are saying that it's a hundred percent staged. What I wonder is why that's that I'm curious about, but other than that, I no other hot takes. Cause the Oscars are completely irrelevant and obviously they're not yeah, cool. Cause, cause now we're, we're talking, talking about it. <laughs> yeah. That might be why. Yes. But for all the wrong reasons, uh, oh, man, Jonathan, what do you think? Oh man. I too want to start by saying that I grew up, with Will Smith, Fresh Prince, uh, he he accepted an award at the VMAs. I want to say it was '99 when he basically said, "Like I'm one of the only rappers out there who's not cursing. I'm family friendly. Like I have my mom let me listen to him. So for so I, so I I, lo I love him for a lot of different reasons. And a lot of the movies he's been in are some of my favorites. A couple of things you cannot convince me that it wasn't rigged, but at this point, that's not the point that I want to make. All right, this is Will Smith who's gone through a lot. He let his wife be with other dudes. And like openly shared that with everyone and writing a book and doing a little tour that he did this year talking about it. Laughs at the joke that Chris Rock makes, then gets the look from his wife. Then he gets on the stage and smacks 
Chris Rock, who's a comedian who gets paid to make jokes like this, right? And then he wins an award moments later. This is where I want I want to focus on, and gets a standing ovation mm -hmm. after 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 conjuring some tears and doing some fake apology where he doesn't even apologize to Chris. The, Hollywood is so messed up, and I'm kind of glad that this happened because now the whole world hopefully sees just how crazy we are for caring about what anybody in Hollywood says about anything. Because he is only getting away with this because he's a celebrity. He's only not in jail because he's a celebrity. And we protect celebrities because they have a huge following. And behind that huge following of celebrities is an institution that needs the money that those celebrities make. And so if he would have been arrested, what, what, what next movie is he going to be in? But now it's this great story. He gets a standing ovation. It made the Oscars relevant again. And he'll be headlining movies for years to come. It's ridiculous. And I think we need to stop giving celebrities free passes for everything they do. or hot take, or let's be as merciful to everyone else in the world as we are to celebrities, because Jesus is merciful as well. Like, but we can't be this middle ground thing where we just let them off and do way worse things than what Will Smith has done. And we give celebrities passes for it um, just to protect the institutions that make money off of them. It's messed up and it's no reason why, or no wonder why so many people in Hollywood are not doing well. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And without that that cushion of celebrity around them, they're just another couple getting arrested at an Applebee's. Like, it's just the way that it goes. Uh, Bridget, go for it. You know, I, I I agree with everyone here, and it definitely speaks to like, okay, violence. It's never okay. I think we can all agree on that. The thing that I think is really interesting is how deeply this is affecting people. I mean, like you said, like the fact that we're talking about this, like. I mean, Instagram just blew up with people saying, this is how I feel about this moment. So something within this moment, rigged or not, touched like a thing in people that it's not sitting well and people are unpacking a lot of their own emotions through this experience. So it's really interesting to see that play itself out. Like a lot of psychologists are going through and saying like, here are some things you might be experiencing from the slap situation. And it's like, whoa, like, it just brings together the gravity of what this meant for some people. And yes, I love Will Smith. Like I would mention beforehand, like he looks like my brother all throughout my brother's high school experience. Like his friends will make fun of him and call him Will Smith and stuff like that. So uh, I've always looked at him and seen my brother. And when I see that, I'm like, oh my gosh, if my brother went up and did something like that, which he <laughs> sometimes reacts, like he, he might do that. Like, what would I do? How would I feel like, what would you think? And it really made me sit with like, okay, people are unpacking this for themselves. I think it calls us to take pause for a second in ourselves and say like, when did I gravely offend someone? Like when was mm -hmm. I Chris Rock in my life? And when did I hurt them to their core in a moment that I can never take back? And whether it was a joke, whether it was like intentional, whatever, like to sit with that moment and identify with Chris Rock. Cause I think it's easy to identify with Will Smith in this, like when you were wrong, but when did you like truly wrong someone? So just unpacking that, but then go the Will Smith angle. Like, when did you react and you can't take it back? You know, like, I think a lot of people in the Catholic community are kind of like throwing shade and, and giving their opinion, but it's like, okay, let's take the beam out of our eyes for just a little bit so that we can say like, oh my gosh, when did I do this to someone? How can I sit with that? How can I take that to adoration and prayer and unpack it for myself? So a moment that's affecting people so deeply in this way, like let's let's have a moment of reconciliation for ourselves a little yeah. bit as well. Yeah, and that that's incredibly valid. And I was as we were having this discussion, I'm very aware that I reacted to this situation personally uh, because of what we do. So Little Flower Media is designed around you know these types of things where we are authentically Catholic people trying to live out you know our lives in that way in a public space and. I want the freedom to tell the truth and not have somebody show up at my house. <laughs> and I think that's a line too far. And so if I'm going to connect with somebody in this circumstance, I'm Will Smith saying something that may be offensive, even if it's design is not to be offensive, right? To that extent. And then having somebody uh, walk up and hit you, I would, I would uh, classify as the, the offense part. Not that, you know, not that you can't offend somebody with your words or actions, but that, you know, that's that's where I think the line gets crossed for me personally. Um, all right, moving on. Topic number two. 
epic Ukraine donor Fortnite leads. So there was an article uh, that came out in PC Gamer today that was talking about how uh, Epic, uh, which you know made Fortnite and owns uh, Fortnite, has been giving all of their proceeds over a three-week period to uh, Ukraine relief, and they are currently the currently the leader in the entire world of corporate donations to Ukraine. Uh, at something that's now quickly approaching $80 million, it looks like, um, with more time left because they're going all the way through April 3rd, I believe. So continuing to grow that number. Um, so we took uh, this pre-conversation uh, a lot of different directions, but we're going to start with Liz and see where she lands on it and then work our way through it. Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, I I think that watching the way the world has reacted to Ukraine is has been fascinating in so many ways, but I think the disappointing thing I've watched from a lot of corporations is how woke this topic has become. Um, to me, it feels like something that has be become a nation's fight for independence, for sovereignty. Now, there's a lot of geo geopolitics that go into this conversation, but um, I, I think watching how corporations have kind of um, you've seen different uh, food suppliers cutting off all things that are brought in from Russia, right? Like there was some company that cut off, I think it was grain supply. Um, Matt, you were, you and I were talking about this. One. Yep. Um, and, and that has been interesting and sort of saddening to me because we know that the people that that's hurting are not, it's not Putin. It's a lot of business owners, workers, the Russian people. So I, I think that, as much as I am, you know, pro Ukraine in this conversation, I think like 90% of the world, um, I think that this is an example in my mind of how corporations, um, especially in the 20th century, this has become kind of this unique phenomenon um, of the past hundred years as corporations have become more and more involved in world events, not just in having executives speak to these functions, but in actually giving so much money away. Now, that's a whole other topic, which is, should they even be doing that? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I sort of miss the days where you could buy a Coke and have it not be a political statement. <laughs> um, so I think that in looking at this with Fortnite and all of this, I, would, I think I would rather a lot of places stay out of it. Yeah, uh, I hear you. And uh, I think that is an element that I think brings a lot of people, especially in the gamer yeah, community, good. I would argue that there's a lot more apolitical people, right, that are don't fall on one side, like each individual issue, sort of they tackle it as they come and don't like being lumped into this category of like, you played this or you support this, therefore, you, you know, whatever that element is. I think that there's some people that just want to like float down the middle of the river and deal with the rapids when they show up. Um, and so it is fascinating to see it be like linked in this corporate level. I totally agree with you. Uh, John, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with what Elizabeth said. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a different like approach. Like I, I think I'm here. I'm not surprised. It's now actually the numbers over a hundred million dollars as of like an hour or two ago. Oh man. So they, in, in like five days or four days, they've raised over a hundred million dollars. And their primary demographic of people that are paying for V bucks and and, and they're, or that are giving this money to Epic, which then is going to Ukraine, are kids. We're talking about we're talking about ages like seven, eight, nine. Obviously, it's their parents' money if it's that age, all the way up to like you know sixteen, seventeen, eighteen years old. And then of course there's the exception, but that's like the majority of people who are playing, who are begging their parents to buy skins. And we I, I, working in youth ministry a lot in the last fifteen years. Um, I was always a def I always defended the youth. Um, a lot of people call the youth lazy. Even the millennial generation, we're lazy. We don't want to help. Gen Z doesn't care about anybody. Um, they're not religious. They don't go to church. I just have not found that to be the case. And I've found that young people really want to believe in something and really want to change the world in a, in a meaningful way, but they don't know how. And so as soon as they get the chance to do something, even if it's as simple as buying V-Bucks on the game that they're going to play anyway, they feel like they're making a difference. And so much so that they've raised over $100 million already in less than a week. Um, and so I think I, I, don't, I don't necessarily uh, know how I, where I stand on, on companies helping with stuff like this, um, but I do think it speaks a lot to where young people are and 
people are willing to help out in ways they think will change the world. And that's beautiful. And there's more ways to do that now than ever, right? With Cash App and like all these different uh, ways you can just easily send money to someone. And some people will send two, three, four, five dollars here on, on someone's TikTok who's going to help someone who's homeless. Um, and these are, this, they're not rich people that are doing this. They just believe in something. And I think that's beautiful. And I do think that video games in general, now this, this is a little sad, but it's just the reality. I think that you're going to see this happen like more and more and more. Um, Fortnite has had concerts, like live concerts over the last few years in a video game. You were talking about the metaverse. We've talked about that in Around the Halo before. I think you're going to start seeing things like video games try to be used for as a force for good. And that's very interesting to me. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, and you touched on something that was kind of interesting is, and this, you know, Liz brought it up as well, is that the corporate structure is really what's choosing to drive this. So I would be interested to see what the average three-week period is over Fortnite sales. I bet it's not that far off. Like, my kids bought skins this month. They weren't aware that the money was going to Ukraine. That wasn't, like, a big push for them. So, you know, it, it, I would be interested to kind of see where the jump in numbers is because of what uh, they're doing. But it's it's not like over this period of time it would have been zero. It's a big step for a company to you know to do that. But what what do you think? You think it's you think it's being you think it's pushing that revenue stream way higher than it would have been normally? I don't know about way higher, but I definitely think it is. But we can look at that. I'm sure the numbers are out there. You can, and we should probably not look at the recent weeks, but just the recent seasons. Mm -hmm. Look at the seven days after a season releases, right? It's the first time I bought V-Bucks uh, in the last month right. because or two. Um, and then right, I saw where it was season. going and it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it'll be interesting to look at. Yeah. Well, what do you think about this, Bridget? Video games used as a fundraising source? I loved this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so cool. I was like, what? And when I read it, I was like, oh man, how in the world did this even get started? Like I wanted to find more about the why and I couldn't find it. And that like, that annoyed me more than anything. <laughs> but I just couldn't find like why this, like who was the driver? Like, you know, I wanted more understanding there so it may be similar to what y'all are touching on which is why i couldn't find a why because i wanted to know you know the, the 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 foundation of this but i think it's cool when companies do focus on humanitarian efforts because it's just that it's for people in need who have nothing else and i my main question was where would the money go otherwise it'd just be lining some <laughs> CEO's pocket in my head. So why not, you know, give it to humanitarian efforts in a country who's desperately in need right now. Um, I read also that, you know, the launch of their new, their new version, I guess, was um, they realized it was poorly timed, but how could they, how could you time something like that? Um, and so they wanted to turn it into something good. So I read it and thought it was super cool. I wish more companies would do things like this to get back to people in need. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, Bull from chat makes a, an important point and distinction in case we didn't make it clear. The money is going to humanitarian efforts in Ukraine, not mm -hmm. Ukraine themselves. This would be a very different discussion if Epic was sending Javelin missiles directly to Ukraine for them to use in a war. That's not, <laughs> that's not the direction that this is taking, but just in case that was unclear. Thanks, Bull, for that, uh, that comment. Uh, Marco, what do you think? Um, this should scare everybody. <laughs> it should be absolutely terrifying because it's performative. They do not care. They're all crony capitalists that are out to seek and get your dollar because at the end of the day, these kids will keep buying V-Bucks. Like they, 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 they fundamentally do not care. Like, honestly, yeah, I do agree, but this is a great thing. It is a great thing that is, go that is going to humanitarian efforts, uh, not Ukraine themselves because i mean, most governments are corrupt uh and like ukraine is no different um so in going and dealing with the ngos in country i do think that's a great thing and look a broken clock is right twice a day right but this is still performative it is entirely not you bridget performative <laughs> woke capitalism is what i'm referencing um but no they, they, they just don't care the minute anybody would actually push back against something if this was going to anything else they would stop they would stop because and this is the thing They'll do stuff like Ukraine. I mean, I want to know, like, where all of the people that work at Epic were like, not one death law, not one more life lost because of COVID. And now everybody's like, to war. <laughs> like, it doesn't make, I want to know where all of those people are. 
right? We are literally, I made a joke last night copying somebody else. Like we're seeing the greatest humanitarian crisis since the Visigoths crossed the rivers into the Western empire, right? That was a, a serious contributing fall to the Roman empire. Like that's 3 million people. That's a lot. That is a massive strain on economies. It's a massive strain on the people and the families. Like these are human beings and all of the connections they take with them and everything else. And there's so much pain there. What I don't need, what I don't need is epic society and what they think is best and what organization they think is best to receive this money, right? And that's what actually really scares me is an organization like Epic, which is so ubiquitous, ubiquitous throughout the world now, right? I mean, Epic will become... Well, we'll I, I really do believe overshadow overshadow Meta, uh, and formerly known as Facebook, the artist formerly known as, mm. um, as they say, and that's what scares me so much is that this is just the first step, and this is how they like they make it seem okay with something that is good, right? But the next time they're gonna do this is what okay Texas curtailed abortion rights, Florida the 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 anti sexual sex ed thir- pre third grade bill, you know okay. We're not giving them money. We're, there's massive, massive hurricane. We're only going to give it to insert place here. And that's really dangerous, right? And like, I personally believe that it's our individual job, that there's a moral requirement for us as Catholics and for Christians and for anybody of goodwill, right? I mean, honestly, who the heck ever to be providing for these NGOs to be doing the work on the ground, right? And to be writing your congressman, doing these things, right? I mean, honestly, they are epics loss of revenue for these three weeks this isn't the only revenue they're getting right this this is a big deal right it is a big deal but i don't know i just think i think it's performative woke capitalism there's a great book on it um called woke inc um and I, the greatest example of that is the the little girl staring down the bowl it was funded by a company to get you to buy etf shares right yeah you know, so marco can i ask you can i ask you a question to help educate me not as an argument. I want to clarify because you know I like to just ask you questions to argue. Um, so <laughs> let's say, let's say, God willing, Little Flower Media blows up to epic proportions. See what I did there? And we want to raise money, right? For like insert religious order here. Um, is that is that different? How is that different than what Epic is doing? And I'm asking in all seriousness. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one, um, we as individuals would be raising money for it, right? We're not giving proceeds from a from a from an endeavor. Gotcha. Which, I mean, and we could, and we could, but the issue the issue I have is, and I should have prefaced this better. So my apologies. Well, but I think you've biggest, done great. That's why I'm asking. I mean, we've never done a dialogue around the halo. So my 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 biggest point really isn't so much like because corporations are societal organisms, right? They are, they 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 do have rights, uh, as per Russell Hittinger, right? Uh, take that, Citizens United, but. What the issue I have is when a non-government, a non-private individual, a non-religious entity, right, something that is completely a- like amoral, not not bad or good, right, by virtue of the fact that it exists, I guess, like because it doesn't actually exist, um, qua exists. You're talking about companies that sell toilet paper and soda and stuff no, 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 no. What I'm saying is specifically like they are leading and giving the most money that should scare everybody because they like at the end of the day, like when you go into like, and I've been in these rooms with these like very famous Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who do all this woke stuff. They don't care. They don't, they just don't. And they act like they do. Yeah. So you're comparing it to when the, whatever the month of awareness is, everybody changes their branding so that they can chase it yeah. whatever i mean whatever you know it's like, breast oh, cancer hey, awareness. Like, okay kids getting beat up july 1st whatever the thing is it's just kind of chasing that element in order to no, it's really serious yeah yeah no yeah, i mean but... it's, a, it's a huge problem because they do they like they they they, they change their logos great what does that do like what are you, who are you caring for what kid the kid that was kicked out of his home because he's going through something Right, like well, what are they're you doing just not kid? offending anyone, so that there's no yeah. reason to. I mean, it's completely performative. Not, not the, rocking the, the boat. The, I think that's my, a valid point. We should uh, add is... this uh, like corporate structure and influence to a future topic, um, yeah. as well, just because this one's getting long. But I've loved it right. the entire right. way through. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, all right, moving right along. 
Uh, U.S. politics, the House of Cards. Uh, this is in reference to the television show, the House of Cards, uh, because an article came out having to do with uh, was this a, a j junior congressman? Was it was a senator? Madison yeah. uh, the Tool Cawthorn. <laughs> yeah, I knew that Matt and Liz would have some thoughts on this, and we'll go to <laughs> that in a second. But essentially, that like uh, somebody had said that they were invited to. Uh, participate in a variety of uh, seedy activities since their time in Washington had began. And um, John threw this out there, which I kind of liked. Is he was basically like, is is U.S. politics actually like that show House of Cards, where it's just like super dark and everybody's stabbing each other in the back and manipulating and doing like the worst possible things that they can think of with their private time. Uh, and I can't speak to that at all. Although I did have a friend of mine who interned in Washington and he said of all the shows at the time that were politically driven, he felt that that was the most accurate as compared to the West Wing and, you know, some, some of the stuff that like had been floating around at the time in terms of the, the world of politics. Um, but I, I thought that was interesting. Liz, you want to start us off on this one? You've got solid background. Hmm. So... When I heard about this, I part of me laughed because of who was saying it, if I'm being 100% honest. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it was a junior member of Congress who has kind of a tenuous record himself of behavior and conduct. Um, I, now, I think that he's obviously done some great things, and I'm sure he and I could sit at a table and find a lot we agree on. But I think that the, the candor and the way he's approached his time in Congress has been a little flippant, to say, uh, to say it lightly. And so I, when I heard this, I wasn't surprised that he was the one saying it, first of all, because I think that sometimes junior members who come in and they're like, I am the gift to DC, right? I am the, the new thing on the block and I am the one that's gonna show all of you what you're doing wrong. In a certain sense, it's like political hubris. It's like, this is the plank in my eye and I don't see it, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so when I heard that, I think every American listening to it should have a bit of a grain of salt in, in their mind um, when they, they hear comments from especially a junior member. Now, everyone likes to talk about the idea that when you go into D.C., everyone should be kicked out after two years. That's a different topic for a different time. But the reality is when you've served in D.C. for a few years, you know a little bit more about the town. So if you really want to know more about the story, it, I would recommend reading what other leaders said about the topic who mm -hmm. you trust. Um, so that's what I did. I read from other people that I actually know who are in this world, who were commenting on his t comments related to really, really nasty things. And they were like, no, and he should probably be reprimanded for lying because we've never heard anyone approach him about these things. No one has ever approached me about these things. And <laughs> And it's causing scandal, defamation, a lack of trust. So when I hear things like that, I think that trust is at an all-time low in our institutions, period, especially our government, right? And so when a member of Congress who was elected to represent people to stand, you know, and, and be a great, you know, hero for his district um, is kind of flippantly throwing around things like that that may or may not be true, you have to, if they are true, they need to be substantiated and they, that would be quite serious. So I don't understand if they are true, why he's not substantiating them, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, if they're lies, shame on him because that's causing a broken system. You know, it, it feels like political pandering. So um, I could talk a lot more about this, but I think that in answer to the question, is DC a house of cards? Yes and no, because <laughs> all human institutions are. I knew we were going to get there eventually. <laughs> no, not the yes and no. <laughs> uh, I, but the best, yes, because John Paul II always said that there are institutions of sin that are in the world because humanity from the time we left the garden is broken, right? So every institution that we create, none of them are going to be perfect, right? So there's, there's structures of sin in, in our societies and they can be reflected in our institutions. But is DC ultimately like the show House of Cards? No. Mm. I, I grew up in DC. I grew up in this world for the majority of my formative years and this was not my experience. Um, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Get her! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think you made a couple of I think you made a couple of great points. I, I would say that 
uh, it's a fascinating element for those people that are like, everyone should be kicked out of Washington every two years because nothing would ever get accomplished ever. Um, if you think about any kind of complicated job that you start where you have to learn the rules and make relationships and do that whole thing, like you're lucky if you're any good at it after two years in a situation where you're, you know, where you're at the top level. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's one. And then the other one is, I think you're going to see, you know, this type of stuff at the highest level of whatever an organization or an industry or a corporate. So whatever, whatever you want to call it. Right. So, I mean, there's a reason that, you know, the, the top level of stuff is kind of kept secret. John, who was the dumb kid on TikTok uh, whose older brother plays in the NFL um, that uh, oh, bless his heart. was disallowed uh, from his brother's bachelor party? Um, Mahomes, uh, Jackson Mahomes. Mahomes. Jackson yeah. Mahomes, yeah. There's a reason that the kid who has a camera on him all the time wasn't invited to the bachelor party of a major NFL athlete. Like, I mean, it's, it's you know, whatever that top level is, there's going to be some stuff that happens you know, good and bad that like, isn't for, you know, everyone's consumption. John, go ahead. What do you think about this? So I am mostly, I'm going to have a short take because I'm really excited uh, about what Elizabeth and Marco have to say living in this. Uh, Bridget, I don't know your background in politics. So it's maybe expensive. I'm excited to hear what you have to say too. Um, but I did a little bit of research. Um, I, I, and I found of all people, the most reliable of sources in politics, Bill Clinton, actually, <laughs> uh, himself. actually had a lot to say about it. Shocker. And no joke, this is a direct quote from Bill Clinton. He said that House of Cards is 99% accurate. And he goes so far to he say- He was just talking about himself. I know. I that, say, is that a bio comment? Right, right. He goes so far to say that the only inaccuracy, the only like 1%, is that there's no way that education bills get passed so quickly. Oh, <laughs> that, that is <laughs> literally. So now I, I, I read the article. I, he, he was probably having fun, of course. And I don't think he was speaking so much about the, the, the mortal sin that happens in House of Cards so much as the backdoor dealings. Um, uh, and that I'm starting to believe that kind of goes into the last conversation that Marco was talking about in Fortnite. Like I have friends, I, I've learned more in the last seven months about business that I have in my entire life. I'm having the time of my life. I love this. Uh, very grateful to, to everybody who's made this happen, Marco and McClure in particular. But uh, people have already approached me and, and companies I'm already working with are like, hey, so do you side here? So do you, do you side here? If you're willing to make this statement, we can partner with you for X. And you're like, what? <laughs> what? Like, how is that a thing? Yeah. In the Catholic world, what? And so yeah. I, I nothing would surprise me. I'm done. <laughs> Bridget, There's, take it away. What surprises you? Oh, so many things. Too many things. That's why I think it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even seen House of Cards. I can only guess. And you know what? I think that there's definitely like an element that we don't know about at all. And I think it's probably worse in ways that we can't even conceive. And my husband, he's a political science major. So he always tries to like tell me all of the intricacies of what's happening and break it down. And some goes in, some goes out the other ear, but he told me that I need to look up the bridge to nowhere. You guys might know more about that, but it was something that happened where it was a back door deal that happened. And okay, so Liz knows what it is. Maybe, maybe she can educate us all, but if you look it up, it kind of is indicative of this whole thing that we're talking about with corruption and and seediness and if it's this dude like who was in the article like of, of course he's trying to get publicity and put his name out there he's probably gonna run for something you know when he gets to a certain point in his career and then we'll look back at this and be like oh that guy you know like so i hate that it's probably worse but i think it's worse <laughs> uh, it's, so it's a fair take for quick background magic uh that was the gravina island bridge which uh was a bridge that connected a small alaskan island to the mainland a uh, very tiny bridge. I just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, it connected them to, I can't pronounce it, to an international airport right there. Uh, the projected cost was $398 million in uh, 2005. <laughs> they could so just double that boats. for now. Yeah. Yeah. Ow. That's fair. No. Um, cool. All right. Well, Marco, what is your what is your take on this U.S. politics house uh, of cards? I completely I disagree. Well, first of all, Madison Cosmore, you're not getting invited to those types of parties. You know, like, you're, you're, like, no one's biting the new kid on the block because they don't know if they can trust you. And second of all, you tweet everything. 
So like, no one trusts you. Like, if if these guys are committing crimes, they're not inviting Madison Cawthorn, Captain Toolbag himself. Excuse me, sorry. Um, but um, I am sure, like my beautiful bride, the better half of our family said, uh, we would find a lot to agree with him on about pro life issues specifically. Uh, and that's probably it. Um, but I think I do think the ho- uh, House of Cards is eerily similar in a lot of ways to the bat, like to what people and how certain political dynasties have angled themselves to try to reintroduce their families and turn this in, into a monarchy in a way that it was never intentioned. Because I mean, the second point to that is our our presidents we elect now have way more power than the kings of England in the 16th, 17th century, right? Which is scary in and of itself. Thirdly, um, what is absolutely baffling um, is that the issue I actually don't believe is the smoke-filled back rooms and the bridge to nowhere, right? I actually think the elimination of pork barrel spending is what's made our government as terrible as it is, right? Because people won't work together. Because before, senator from Virginia would work with the senator from Tennessee, even if the senator from Tennessee was super conservative and the senator from Virginia was a diehard Democrat, right? They would work together because the senator from Virginia is going to help the senator from Tennessee get the inland port that they need for infrastructure building in Tennessee, right? And th- things would get done and they'd move. Uh, but it's not the case now. House of Cards is really true. There's some really terrible people in government, um, but it's not. It's obviously not. Like, they're not blowing coke on, like, their desks in Congress. Like, I don't doubt that there's people who do drugs at all. <laughs> like, z- zero, I doubt, I, I mean... The immorality is rampant, all of these things, but they're not inviting Madison Cawthorn to it. It's like, <laughs> that's, it's like that's he, is, he did take. not get invited to the frat party. So two things came from Marco's uh, take there. One is that um, they're not having any fun in U.S. politics at all. And number two <laughs> is that after those comments, Liz can never call you a monarchist again. So congratulations. We've totally <laughs> removed that from your family zeitgeist, and you can just move on. Five dollars uh, says we'll argue about a time before you go to bed. <laughs> there's <laughs> no way unless you start it. That's that's your own version of backdoor politics. Um, all right, moving on. We got a couple more fun topics to finish with. Your best or favorite film portrayal of priests. Um, this was a fun one, partially because uh, I know there's a new movie coming out. I'm blanking on the name of it. Father Stew. Father Stew. Thank you. Yep. And so that uh, got this topic some traction. Um, but I also think it can be difficult to go back through and find a valid portrayal of priests in film. Um, so let's start this one off with uh, Bridget. What do you think? Do you have a favorite in this oh, realm? I'm so glad I'm starting this because it's silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's silence all day. Like I love that movie so much, and I just think like it's it's just when you think about a priest, like you want to think about all of these like you want to you want to think about like the goodness right and you want to see the mission and you want to see the humanity and you kind of want to see it all happening at the same time and i just you know and we're talking about portrayal of a priest so for me it's like portrayal of the holiness and the human and i think that it's just so well done through andrew garfield like i love that movie though and it it's a complicated movie and i think thinking about priests is complicated like I got to spend some time with Father Rob Gallia and he kind of like opened the door a little bit into like how people perceive his humanity as a priest too and like as you get to know priests as people like this is a huge struggle for them you know and being on the pedestal but still being a person and um, I think that that movie especially highlights a lot of things with that and I just think that it's a wonderful wonderful film so silence yeah Silence, good poll. All right, Marco, what do you think? Uh, I wrote my thesis on Silence, and it was a very good movie, other than the uh, big uh, theological issue at the end there. Uh, <laughs> but that was a directing choice. I may have worked my last year uh, with the guy, part, some of the guys who funded it um, in college, and that was a choice Martin Scorsese made. It's also not what you... Oh, no. Fallen. I don't know what just fell. One of your panels. One of the panels that you couldn't quite Um, reach when you were sticking it to the wall. Well, anyways, um, yeah, great movie. My, I actually have a a contra opinion to that. 
Um, I if silence was happening, I'd hope the priest let me die. But secondly, um, I think the best portrayal of a priest I've ever seen is a movie called Calvary. Um, very similar in the vein to Silence um, and to Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver's uh, expression. Have, have any of you guys seen Calvary other than Liz? No? I've heard of it, though, as of what? today. What? You're funny. No, uh, like as of like, like, like six hours ago. Oh, really? Yeah, it's seriously. Amazing. It's, 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 it's an amazing story. It's deep. It's dark. Um, it's challenging. It's extremely challenging because, I mean, there is a lot like Bridget said, the humanity of priests. Priests are human, right? Uh, they may seek to, they may seek to be as close to Christ as possible to affecting the mass, right? But they're still men, um, and so that's great. That's my favorite one. Sweet, uh, Liz. Favorite portrayal of priest. I was going to talk about Calvary, um, but I should have known Matt was going to talk about it. But (laughs) I will tell you a synopsis of the plot line, though, is when you guys should all watch it. But the first thing you find out at the beginning of this movie is a man walks into the confessional and says, in X amount of days, I'm going to kill you because of the sins of another priest. I was abused by a priest. And he said, well, I haven't done this. What you know, what are you saying? And he said, it doesn't matter. Um, You're a priest. And the the topics from there are so powerful just like as you walk through the movie um and it's worth watching with a bunch of friends and talking about it at the end um that's i think my favorite portrayal in terms of like kind of a substantive the humanity of a priest um wrestling with um you know even scandal sin sadness brokenness within the clergy and in the bride of christ but my favorite all-time portrayal of a priest in a movie is the scarlet and the black um, have any of you guys seen this? It's an old movie. It's a classic Gregory Peck. Um, and it's a true story. It's an Irish priest. And I'd be remiss if I, I didn't say that because he worked in the Vatican during World War II. And he saved, I want to say, like a thousand, um, you know, Jews in Rome, um, smuggling them, hiding them um, was just so heroic. So it's it's a really, really beautiful portrayal of a priest. And Christopher Plummer's in it, too. So the cast is amazing. Excellent. I now I have two movies. Up. I guess I'll watch them both tonight. <laughs> <laughs> John with unlimited time. <laughs> Go for it, John um so i wanted to say nacho libre because that is i i am not kidding when i Why tell are you not baptized i never got around to it that is a top five theological movie and i will fight about that another time uh it's 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 a beautiful movie to be completely honest but and then i almost wanted to choose um gran torino i remember that gran torino had a great priest and that movie was dark and very very good but i'm gonna choose a non-movie and pick uh the priest in daredevil um, that's the one that has impacted me the most of, of a priest in any show. And I'm shocked. And I, I'm not a comic nerd. I'm sure all the comic nerds in the chat are going to roast me and be like, well, that, it's not Marvel who made that choice. It's the people who wrote the comics. Okay, whatever. But in the show, I'm not familiar with the comics. In the show, uh, Matt Murdock's faith is a huge part of it. In fact, I think it's like the center of the entire show is this fight that he's having between like justice and is it okay that he's like, do the, do the ends justify the means? Um, and, no. and I, I, he's going, he's going through this and the priest is there and he's real and he's giving him advice that sometimes and often he doesn't take, but he keeps coming back and the priest keeps welcoming him back. Um, even the story of the nuns and the sisters that he lives with, uh, I thought they were really well portrayed, uh, as well. And so I love it. Uh, and all three seasons of daredevil, like especially season three, he comes back to this priest, um, and, and really lets this priest kind of guide his conscience, which is beautiful. And so I thought they did a great job, and that stood out to me the most. I changed my mind. John's right. Daredevil. I didn't know shows were on the, if shows were on the table, Athelstan in Vikings. Come on now. Oh, I, I need to see Vikings. Yeah, I haven't seen Vikings either. Yeah. But... Have you seen it, Liz? Yeah, Matt, you know what I have? He's in The Brown Habit, right? Yep. And he's, I remember that storyline is just, there's so much that happens. And that, But that show is I remember insane. I watched the episode. I don't want to say what it is in case anyone's watching it, but like the like heroic part of his character and I remember yes. being like I'm so glad he was portrayed that way there's so many mm. moments there's so many moments of weakness and sadness and and I was and skipping triumph. custom games we're watching Vikings after <laughs> <laughs> dude everyone I love keeps telling me to watch Vikings it's I think. so 
good. Uh, good Sorry. polls, everybody. A uh, quick shout out for a little film called Keeping the Faith, which is a romantic comedy from the 90s or early 2000s. Edward Norton, uh, no. Jenna Elfman, and uh, Ben Stiller are all childhood friends. Edward Norton becomes a Catholic priest. Ben Stiller becomes a rabbi. And Jenna Elfman kind of gets caught in the middle of uh, a little kind of love triangle just from a perspective of humanizing a very real struggle that a priest, you know, could go through, right, in terms of, like, being around people when you've made a vow where you get caught up in the middle of some feelings that aren't directed at you but your friends are, and it probably is a little kind of – probably a little real-world application. Um, Totally lighthearted. Nothing terrible happens. It's not scandalous. It is just – a, a nice little movie that I remember being like, oh, look, you know, real people, you know, kind of trying to deal with struggles in a non uh, sinful way. Uh, yeah. Can I do a quick plug really quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, Father Stu uh, movie. That's going to definitely be my favorite. I've already cried twice. Watching the trailer. <laughs> You've only seen the trailer. Um, I, I know. So it's I cried true, twice. you guys. I've looked over I, and I was like, what are you watching? He's like, oh, Father Stu. <laughs> Mark Wahlberg changed my life. I love him. On a business trip watching instant family that's what led liz and that honestly what started the adoption journey for us two years three years ago um true story and and foster care was that movie i have no doubt in my mind you can't hear me smacking my table but i am <laughs> smack, no, we smack, can, with your smack. house no, no, of cards ring with my house of cards <laughs> ring yeah exactly uh i think that this will be one of the the most consequential portrayals of a priest um, and I think it will become part of the cultural zeitgeist um, just because of how well it looks like it's done. Sweet. He said it was the most important movie he's ever done, so I can't wait to watch it. I so excited. It. I We're going to buy a whole the theater. Best cool. lines I think I've heard in a movie, right? Oh, it's like, yes. let's, let's not pray for an easy life, but the courage to endure a difficult one. I love so, that. Yeah. Uh, Alex dropped the trailer in chat for anybody that is interested and hasn't seen it. Okay. We're going to make up some time here with our last couple of topics. I know we're going a little bit long tonight, but not for bad reasons, just because we're having incredible uh, oh, discussions. Probably because of my monologue. Yeah, earlier. but that I was, mean... It was so good, though. But it's so clippable and, and great, so don't, great. don't sweat it I'm going to get so canceled. <laughs> I'm get fired from all my jobs. Not if someone walks on stage and slaps you. Um, okay. <laughs> You'll be outstanding ovation. <laughs> Extend universal school lunches. So actually, this came up... Uh, from a tweet that I saw, which was basically like, while we're talking about Will Smith slapping Chris Rock, here are some things that are going on that people are not paying attention to. And I know we all kind of read some of those tweets on stream the other day um, where we were in it, but it looks like they uh, are closing the door for extending universal school lunches. Uh, Some of the details involved in this are that there were some qualifications during covid that they removed in order for more schools to qualify for being able to give um food to students and qualify for this uh process i do think that there are clearly two sides to the issue one of them is that in order to get uh funding for universal school lunches there is like a balanced diet requirement in terms of what they have to do michelle thanks michelle um, so they can't just, uh, they can't just, you know, give away a pack of Oreos and be like, we want to be reimbursed by the government for this. Uh, but at the same time with current supply chain issues, there are some schools that will not be able to qualify for it because they didn't get a shipment of milk for six weeks and it wasn't available in their area. So they would then be removed from it. Um, John, you said you did some research on this and had some takes. Why don't you start us off? I have so many, I have so this is not going to be fast. No, well, I have so many takes on school lunches, believe it or not, Please be and fast school in general. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, Marco, in you Illinois, can go now and be back by the time it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> I, I want Marco to hear this. My <laughs> <laughs> time doesn't start. Okay, it starts now. So there is a public school near, and I don't know how this works in the rest of the country, but around here, um, the the public schools are paid for by property taxes, okay, in Illinois. So there are like people, and, and, and the lines are so drawn and so that athletes can get scholarships, if, even though those are illegal. It's ridiculous. There is a public school named, called Stevenson near us. You're familiar with it, McClure. Mm-hmm. They serve sushi during their hot lunch. I'm not even kidding. 
And in Chicago, when COVID first started, they the first thing they cut was the lunch program in the inner city schools in Chicago. So, and they're all paid for by the government and by the by the property taxes. So, that's not even what I want to talk about, though. I just wanted to prove that I'm passionate about this. <laughs> it's a crazy debate, but the really it's a larger and the issue. Sushi is luxurious. It's amazing. I want to go to that school. <laughs> there is a larger issue at play here, and that is school in general. The government should not be taking care of our kids eight to ten hours a day. It's just, it is, it is unbelievable that we're still doing this. If they have to, sure. If the government has to, sure. Feed them all. I don't care. Feed all the kids. Food is good. I get that. But the issue in general is that we live in a society that forces families to let someone else raise their kids. And it shouldn't be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. We can fix it. I think it's no joke. One of the biggest downfalls in America right now, even Switzerland, who likes to give everything away for free, lets kids go home for two hours a day and have lunch and enjoy a little break in, the, in their midday. And then, and by the way, they walk home, like without the cops calling, you know, someone walking, like a kid walking out without a parent, because that's where we live here in America. It, we, if we're going to continue to let the government raise our kids, fine, feed them all and feed them good food. But it's ridiculous that that we're letting some, the, the government raise our kids. Mic drop. <laughs> great, great poll, John. It's going to be hard to argue with that. But Bridget, why don't you go ahead and try? Oh, there's so many holes in that argument as a working mother. Are you kidding? <laughs> like, I agree, but it, it, it would never work. Unless you have a blended intergenerational family living in your home, like I do, and like the Mark Lady's, who could possibly make something like that work. But like working parents can't make that work unless a lot of things change. But that side, like that's a different argument for sure that we should totally have on this on Around the Halo. But I think, yes, it should definitely be extended. I think food is the great equalizer. And if we're talking about nutrition, like we don't know if kids get a good night's sleep when they go home. We don't know what their struggles are. And this is across the board, right? Like parents don't know what they're doing. Like they feed their kids junk. Like they don't know what nutrition things they need. And this, this is everywhere. This is at private schools. This is that, you know, lower income families, whatever, like kids, kids don't get nutritious meals. And if that could be helped to educate them, right? Because this is all in the name of education and helping students get a good education. And if food is something that you can help in that, and this is already on the table, by all means, extend it because it's only going to help our kids be able to think more clearly. I mean, the benefits are obvious, right? When you have a good meal. Um, so I say extend it, you know, if the money is there and if we can reroute some things like, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you guys both make great points on opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> One, John being using what was your example? What country? Uh, Switzerland. Switzerland. So one of the Switzerland. one of the countries that always gets the the highest uh, income per capita that has the greatest laws to help protect workers that is designed around you know healthcare that everyone has access to 100 percent of the time that has built a societal structure on the success of that unit where kids can walk home for two hours and not have a problem. Um, I know that my wife worked in downtown Chicago when she first started teaching, and a lot of those kids, that's the only meal that they could count on was the one that they got from the school. Um, and so it's uh, we're a little large as a nation to just put everything, you know, on that one, you know, piece of the puzzle and be like, we should, we should be more involved as parents. I just think that there's a reality that most people, I shouldn't say most people, there are a lot of people that unfortunately that don't have great parents. And as a result, you can't always rely on that structure. Um, with that said, uh, there probably, you know, we, there probably should be more some pushback on Bridget's side to be like, we're, we're cultivating a society where both parents have to work in order to be successful. And that's maybe or maybe not the best thing for not our even family successful unit. magic, but to survival to for life. survival. To yeah, survive. right. And I so hope like, my point was clear that that is what's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And so I like think, that is uh, that needs to change. I was just trying to bring that together for you guys. Matthew, it's your turn. OK, uh, so I think both John and Bridget are wildly incorrect. Great. Um, because, you got a third option. Um, <laughs> your wife was option. applauding me during my take. I will. <laughs> I clipped it. I'm going to fight this. This yeah. is how because... the fight started, Marco, later. Just so you know, this was <laughs> That's it. fine. No. And the, and the reason why I'll start with Bridget, because I actually heard the whole thing, and then I'll make up John's argument in my head, and I'll go off that one. Um, <laughs> as per usual. <laughs> as per usual. Um, but the issue is, is that Michelle Obama tried this, and I do believe it was truly well-intended. 
right? But as the government does with anything, there's an obsession with the exception when our regulators regulate, right? And people fall through the cracks. When there's no pr principle of subsidiarity, the federal government cannot, ought not, should not do this, and it would be an a non-Catholic decision for it too. If a local community, if a city or town, township, ward, district, whatever, insert name here, decides to do this because they have a larger than average amount of children that are in low, lower than uh, inc low income households is the only meal they can. But honestly, like the issue, the issue we have to Bridget's point about nutritious meals is one right now, I guarantee you most people do. I, I, I would bet that most people have a better take on nutrition than the American federal system dictates is what we should be eating because all of those things were dictated by the dairy lobby, by the grain lobbies, <laughs> right? Like the ag bill, right, is the largest bill. One of our great friends is a lobbyist that's only lobbied the ag bill every five years for 30 years, right? <laughs> Snap, EBT, right? Everything's tied up in the ag bill, right? So this is a whole. So I don't. I shouldn't say I disagree with Bridget because I, I do agree. I do agree with Bridget. I don't think. The, I don't think the federal government can effectively regulate something like this. A local community can and ought to, uh, because that is because that, that it it is something that we can we can help. We can do. And if we're all effectively at the end of the day paying a forty percent effective tax rate, then somebody better get the the stuff back in the form of goods and services from the thieves. Uh, but I do think that we are society, right? Man was not meant to be mom, dad, two kids, and a dog. Man was meant to live in community. We were made for that. We were made to live in intergenerational households, right? Of course, Gloria Steinem became Gloria Steinem because women were completely isolated in the 1950s, right? You were separated entirely from all of the wisdom that came before you, right? And it was lonely and it was sad. And you were left out there, right? We and, and men going off into this corporate desolation, right? You see the destruction of the family begin there. Uh, we've accepted so many lies as Americans, and that the, the issue, just like John's saying, um, I don't, I don't think I, I think what John is saying, the the problems are right, maybe the solutions wrong, but we've accepted so many lies as Americans that this is the way things should be. We might, we might be able to look to other places to figure out how to do that correctly, you know, but obviously it has to be done in an in American context where everybody has to have a car to live. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different, yeah. uh, different circumstance. I love doing this kind of stuff with you guys because this is, seems like a super simple question. And then we have John and Bridget with a very boots on the ground answer based on personal experience. And then you got Marco with a 10,000 foot view of like, well, here's what's going on that all trickles down <laughs> into this situation. Liz, where do you want to take this conversation? Honestly, I, what I was thinking about it when the question was posed was more along the lines of where Matt was, which is education funding. This to me is such a, a, a trickle down question because it has to do with how our local communities deciding where these resources go. And that is, I think, the kind of apex question of why our education system is broken is that the federal government is dictating a lot of things that it shouldn't be across the board, but education in particular to this conversation, I, I believe that those funds should be block granted and sent back to the states so that you know Illinois and Florida can decide what's best for their educational systems at a local level. Um, our country was never founded upon the idea that the government would be deciding what kids ate for breakfast in California and in Connecticut, right? That's a complete misuse of government funds um, and time, in my opinion. Um, so I think the state should kind of regain power in this instance, and especially when it comes to things like all that money, if those, this is such a pet peeve of mine when it comes to the education system is um, all the money that goes into education, if we were more thoughtful about it and took maybe some of the money that was going to sushi lunches and created things like voucher programs, right? Can you imagine what we could do and what our world would look like? I, I'm a big believer that a rising tide raises all boats. And so if we Chips. took that money and, you know, we, we put it in, in better, better hands where teachers, communities had to compete against each other to raise standards of education that 
this this school has a sushi buffet but this one has a great books curriculum and you get to choose isn't that america we have 18 kinds of toothpaste i it's think there's a huge it. issue though because because <laughs> right? um, education the education budget come from the lo the lo locales property taxes so when you're talking about the 13th ward in new orleans versus beverly hills right beverly hills can afford the sushi lunches and this is one of the issues of like of not having the block grants right is that it's not standardized across the board i'm sorry Liz didn't mean to interrupt uh, but you're kind of right and kind of wrong. Just know that he's never interrupted any of us on the show before. <laughs> we'll Don, talk about this is why later. I hate you. <laughs> I um, also was thinking before the show we should do a this or that. Kitchen cabinets, should they ever be open after Matt goes through the kitchen? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about, how, this, this or that? How? How? This? Oh, the Amazon you warehouse in our mud room. <laughs> how about not buying things on Amazon? It's just so easy. Oh, you so guys easy. are the best. This, is like, this I, has been, been really fun. That. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sum up with this in a very lighthearted viewpoint. I want to stop taking shots at sushi for lunch. It's healthy. It should be an option. Like I like I don't. It's get... in contrast with Chicago yeah. having no lunch. I understand. I totally get it. I'm just saying that, like, like you know, getting your hands on healthy food should be the goal, not the you know, not the target, right? Like, I would rather be like, <laughs> let's bring sushi lunch to you know underprivileged areas so that there's you know uh, something good Omega for everybody 30s. to eat, as opposed to be like, well, we gotta get, we gotta share this oh, money. They got so much money for sushi lunches and that's just because i i love sushi that's where that comes from all right here we go final oh sorry go ahead marco uh really quick and the the anti-block block grants and anti-voucher program was based off an anti-catholic supreme court ruling um from like 80 years ago when they didn't want school choice to happen because of the catholic schools the catholic moving on <laughs> wait, wait, wait. one more one more thing one more thing go ahead go ahead Okay, this is just really funny. So when I was a youth minister in Manitowoc, that's when Michelle Obama rolled out her whole like school lunch thing. <laughs> Again, I think it's very well intentioned for sure. Absolutely. But no joke, the, the little tiny Catholic school that had 100 kids in it that I like visited as part of one of the schools that, that was in the town. So I visit there for lunch once a week. The, the lady who was working there was 75 years old and she was making homemade lunch with organic products every <laughs> single day. And then they took, no, but then Michelle Obama's bill came through whatever oh, it was, yeah. and they had to serve pre-made like, fake whole wheat stuff, like not real whole wheat. You guys know what I mean? When you get real whole wheat, right? It's the first ingredient has to be like wheat or whole wheat. Like it was the, all the fake stuff. And the woman was like, I can't believe that I have to like microwave all the stuff when I was making oh, homemade sad. stuff. You mean like Kraft mac and cheese? See, this is the problem when government gets involved in all these things. It's like, this is a perfect example of that when DC says, I know best, so eat your prepackaged lunch. And grandma, who's been doing this for 50 years, is like, yeah. did I know nothing? Excuse right? me, but how do you Mamaw? like how do you find the balance between <laughs> everything, right? Like that's then I think the it's, it's it's moving more power back to state legislatures. There's right. there's so many good books and arguments on this topic saying that the removal of I think it's with the 18th Amendment that removed the that basically allowed for the direct election of senators. 17th Amendment. But 17th Amendment. Um, because before, none of us smart. would remember this. Senators were elected to be a direct kind of answering call to the body in the state. So the state legislator would have elected the two senators and they would have been really held accountable to their state officials. Now that relationship is really stymied. The repeal of the 17th Amendment is contributing to the destruction of America. That's my talking point. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so is this, is this why you don't like Hamilton? Because Hamilton is more so like government involved, right? No, well, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. My my thing, I think Liz, Liz would probably agree with this too. Just because the federal government shouldn't do it doesn't mean a government shouldn't do it. Correct. Gotcha. I agree. So, okay. And, and that's the way I specifically feel it. about how, uh, like with, with most things, right? If we're looking at Sintesi Musanus and Ram Navarum and talking about Catholic social teaching, the, the underlying principle is subsidiarity and community. So how do we encourage that? And sure, there may be federal solutions, but I don't think that when the DC, the, the DC bureaucrats going to have, it, they may get how Anacostia works, but they're going to have no idea how River, Riverdale on the south side of Chicago works, right? And what's going on there. Because they're not, because people will fall through the cracks. We saw this in the foster care system being there. You have regulations in, uh, that are well-intended, right and that but even with our exception with the exception in our modern day modern day right 
people fall through the cracks because it's not there's not that subsidiarity and social workers are not empowered and the people on the ground are not empowered to make decisions right it was still the daddy fed knows best and i don't think that i think our social worker terry who's the most awesome maternal woman i've ever met my entire Amazing. life yeah. right should have the ability to make decisions and care decisions on the go you know but okay that's a whole different conversation sorry this, this has fair. been such a fun show <laughs> this is good um we got one topic left and we're gonna fire it out real quick because it's easy and entertaining um <laughs> The space race, is it the new <laughs> land rush? So this uh, was uh, something that Liz threw out um, in terms of like, who is going to own these things, right? If we're on a quest to get to space and we're headed to Mars and we're going to, you know, set up a lunar base and do those types of things, then who's going to be in charge of it? Is it going to be the corporations that pay to get there? Is it going to be world governments? Are you going to be able to purchase uh, a star with your name on it, which you can already do for about $17? Um, that eventually someone will have to pay dividends to your family because they travel there and set up set up camp. Um, I don't know. Let's uh, start you off with this one, Marco. What do you think about? Oh man, I am ready, and I was distracted by Twitter. No, I'm kidding. Marco's distracted. Um, spam the emote. Spam the emote. Uh, sp spam the emote. No, I think that the, this is something hugely important. I mean, we are in the the space race is the next is the next wild west. I mean, we are in our time, right? I mean, we could have like. Uh, Warner Von Braun, uh, who was the pioneer of the space program um, in the 60s and 70s, who was, in fact, actually, sadly, a Nazi scientist um, and developed their missiles, uh, actually developed our, our, our space program. We had the technology to get physically to Mars 50 years ago, but Nixon scuttled it in because nobody, want, nobody, wanted, to make the, nobody wanted to spend the money on it, right, because we had so many other things going on. I think it was one of the worst decisions, the most – short-sighted thing the american government has ever done other than getting involved a the cia doing anything with drugs anywhere in the world um but hot take uh the issue with all of this right now I mean, we're seeing private space exploration occur because the government cannot do it um and what does that mean it means that elon musk is going to be the new overlord <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know at this point i'm kind of here for it um, I'm kind of here for it. I don't know who I'd vote for if it was a three-way election between Biden, Trump, and Elon. Um, I might vote for the eldest toad. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> I think that I think that uh, um, that was like a tirade that was interspersed with memes. Um, if you can pick them all, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Um, <laughs> but one of the fundamental issues is that space. We're, we we were given dominion as man, right, by the Godhead, right, by the Trinity over this planet, right. And we encouragedly engaged in actions. And I'm not like, I am not a huge climate change guy, right? But we are engaged in practices like I, that is strip mining, um, not taking care of our oil pipelines well enough uh, in certain countries, um, not taking care of our oil derricks well enough in other countries. Um, we are engaged in systematic exploitation of our environment when we could systematically exploit rocks in space and make so much more money why don't we just go to space i'm done cool <laughs> liz you want to take it away on this one elon will be sending matt his check after the show um, <laughs> that would be great pay every single dollar of it <laughs> <laughs> no i when i was reading articles today on this and i was like this topic is fascinating it's like are we gonna have the planet of pepsi are we gonna have like you know hewlett packard star over there i don't know because i think that matt's right i think that this race is being decided by private corporations which in a sense is very like you know, New World Columbus type sponsoring, right? Um, the New World was discovered primarily because of private benefactors, you know? There were obviously governments that supported them, but there were families that, that put up this money to be able to discover North America, right? Right, um, right. Now, I think that when we look at space and think about this, I think that it's going to be a similar situation where um, there's going to be corporations, individuals that are funding um, these sorts of explorations. And I think that the world is going to have to pay up if they want to participate. Um, so maybe it would be a better thing if governments were involved in it, because I think it might democratize space a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, Bridget, what do you think? This is crazy. 
<laughs> it is, is like, crazy. Yeah, it is this crazy. This is like so crazy. Like, it's just it, even when I saw it, I was like, what? you know, like it's it's crazy. Um, but I like Liz's point about like discovering the new world because you know it makes me think about how like you know yeah the new world was discovered, but like people were there, right? Like people were there, they got kicked out. <laughs> and they got moved who are we moving <laughs> who is there that's, that oh, will be that's gonna be for the next time we have to talk about that question <laughs> oh. that's what's circling Alien, in my head i'm like or not <laughs> that's all that i can think about is what is going on on these other planets that we have no idea about like because you know we only know what we know and it's this small fragment of nothing when we think about the the how big god is like it's like you can't fathom it you know it like it hurts my brain sometimes and i really sit and ponder the universe and god in that and god outside of time and and my like small minuscule place in that and then i think about aliens <laughs> or like people living on other planets like you know the i just want to know who who what do they have to say about yeah. Pepsi owning their planet. <laughs> what do they have to say about this? So, but it's such an interesting discussion. You know, I hope companies don't take over this thing because, you know, we think so much in ads and capitalism and things like that. And it's, you know, this is, this is, uh, I mean, this is the grandeur of God and the, the bigness of God. And we're getting a sneak peek of it in a way. And it is to me truly mind blowing. Agreed. John finish it off as an expert in apocalyptic literature because i read <laughs> the giver one time and <laughs> that's and, your version of the apocalypse uh, on another no, show apocalyptic I've seen that movie 30 times. literature yeah. and as an expert of apocalyptic space shows like the 100 mm -hmm. um i want no part of space man i th this is listen if, if we weren't about to start world war three then maybe but if we think that we're in trouble now Wait until like actual war for space happens. It, I've seen I've seen the show 100. It's going to get crazy. It's going to be like resources are, are dying. Other countries are going to want to get involved that otherwise weren't involved. And all of a sudden we're fighting for space to live. I will die on Earth. I, you could not pay me a million. I'm not even kidding. Elon Musk could call us, call me tomorrow and say, I will give $10 million to Little Farm Media. All you have to do is go to space in one of my rocket ships and then it. come back do down it. in three days. I'll I would say, not, no shot. I do you know how many people are going to do it? Do you know how many people drag your happy ass <laughs> into that space shuttle? Do you know how many people have, from space? Do you know how many people have died? Do you know how many people died looking for the new world? Do you know how many more are going to die trying to actually occupy space? It is going to be crazy. I want no part of it. And you know what? My hot take is that the Lord won't even let it happen. World ends before then. Oh. How many people died driving down the street this year? Wow. Right. There he goes. <laughs> All right. So what we learned is that John is selfish um, and wouldn't go into space for three days uh, for the future of our company. So, oh um, wouldn't risk his life. All of the wives would be with taking Will John and throwing it in. Space. This is oh, Men in Black. That is the best point. This is Men in Black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we started with Will Smith and now we're at space. Yeah, we so came full circle. Of tonight is Men in it's Black. Meta. So there is this fascinating uh, series of books called The Expanse. There's a show on Amazon that's about it. And I think that it is incredibly apropos because it is a quick 50 to 70 year jump into the future where it's not about like, you know, warp speed and traveling to other planets, but it's like the inevitable colonization within our own system. So mm -hmm. Mars has been colonized. They have their own government. Earth is feeding off of the the belt, the asteroid belt, where all the minerals and resources are, and still exploiting those workers and taking all of the wealth that exists there in order Capitalism to. Capitalism doesn't change our planet. Uh, yeah, right. And like it, it's a, and then you know as the series goes on, it gets a little more sci-fi. But the opening of that world is, I believe, a hundred percent certainty within you know whatever the time frame is that people choose to you know get to that point right it's not impossible to travel that far we're not breaking any laws of physics we have sent things you know that distance within our own galaxy we know that that's where the resources are so people are going to pay money to get there and then they're going to figure out a way to make more money off of it <laughs> so Me. 
Uh, yeah, and M Marco and I have a shared love of science fiction in that regard. So clearly, that's mainly the only reason why I feel so strongly about this. Of a rocket shape. <laughs> what did you say? I said Matt has a piggy bank in the shape of a rocket ship. We're saving <laughs> to go to space. That's awesome. not even true. Se that's second honeymoon. You, you, need, you need to go to confession now. That's a lie. Some that's people want to go to Jamaica. <laughs> he wants to go to Mars. <laughs> She's right. a comedian, Marco. Let it go. Well, this has been a fantastic show. I've enjoyed it across the board. Elizabeth Santora Marcolini is our winner for tonight. As per Woo! tradition, she gets 30 seconds to talk about anything she wants. It can be a shameless self-promotion, or it can just be affirming her incredible husband, or it could be, you know, just showing pictures of Zelly for 30 seconds, which is my vote. Um, but as we go here, Elizabeth, you now have 30 seconds to talk about anything and everything you want. Your time starts now. I'm still right about Constitution of Since you started talking about Zelly, I have to talk about this because I feel like I know that there's a, a lot of, like, people our age on the show, and um, if you're anything like Matt and I, I think before becoming parents, you're kind of like, this is scary. We left the hospital with Zelly. Matt literally looked at me and was like, we are unsupervised, <laughs> totally unsupervised. And, and there's, I think this moment where maybe if you're wondering, like, do I ever want to be a parent? Could I ever want to be a parent? Just know that God gives you so much grace to fill whatever brokenness, whatever fears you have. And loving your kids well is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. So I feel like that story needs to be told more because being a parent is the next great adventure. It's not the next great world ending event. Um, I think that's a lie that culture wants to sell you that kids are the end of you. And in fact, they're just a beautiful new beginning. That is awesome and well said. Um, and it is not Amazing. lost on me now that my children have walked downstairs into my studio multiple times and I have been like, get away from me, I'm live on a show. And um, <laughs> now... I get to go to confession in that uh, particular regard. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. That is um, venial at best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. Can I get a ruling? You're welcome. Blevins? Bless Perfect. yourself with holy water. You're fine. Extra points for John Judges, Blevins. do we get a ruling? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, this has been super fun on Around the Halo tonight. And if for no other reason, our conversations went so many directions that I don't even need topics for the next show. I already have you know, six or seven ideas based on, on, you know, what we discussed tonight. So this was super fun chat. We appreciate um, all the love and support that we get from you guys. Uh, and obviously uh, the discussions in the chat were super fun as well. Um, so uh, we appreciate you guys. And uh, this is great. Do we need anything else uh, tonight, yeah. John, itinerary wise? Just a, a third shout out to uh, Elizabeth for filling in tonight. Mm -hmm. You were awesome mm -hmm. and hope to have you again. Uh, just a, a pleasure to hear all of your takes that I often hear through Marco. Uh, m every time he says something smart, I'm like, oh, that's probably Liz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, kidding. Love you, Marco. But, um, but seriously, thank you. And Bridget, of course, as always, love, love, love working with you. It's so fun. We are actually going to be doing uh, custom lobbies tonight for the first time in three years because i hate playing with the community but we're going to do it tonight because i love the community and so so we're gonna go we're gonna end the stream and go live in just a second so refresh the chat in about three minutes and we'll play some fortnite community games with building all right thanks all appreciate it another good episode of around the halo and we will see you uh next week for um pardon the intercession thanks a lot <laughs>